Bitte. The first reading is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27 onwards to chapter 2, verse 4. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. If you have any encouragement from being uni united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. This is the word of the Lord. If I were to say to you, describe a German, how would you describe them? I suggest we don't go for it out loud uh, right now, but uh, uh, there may well be all sorts of things about their kindness, their organisation. Uh, what about a Frenchman or, or, a, or, or someone from Spain or someone from uh, America? There are all sorts of ways in which we might uh, describe people because they have particular characteristics. And um, uh, if you were a Philippian, well, again, you'd have had particular characteristics. There was a real privilege in being a Philippian. It was as good as being a Roman in the Roman Empire. It was a Roman colony. It was, sort of, it was where sort of senior civil servants would um, retire to. Uh, it, was a, it was a great place. And uh, to be a Philippian it meant the protection of Rome. It meant all the opportunities of trade. It had strong allegiance to Rome. And therefore, as a Philippian, you'd be very committed to the advance of Rome. So you behave in, a sort of way, in the right sort of way. Uh, someone might say to you, well, that's not very Roman. And uh, you'd be very afraid about the fact that people thought that maybe you weren't being very Roman. I suppose if you were a school teacher, you might have said to a young Philippian, you not just let me down, yourself down, you let the whole of Philippi down. You know, it was a very important thing to be a Philippian. Now, one reason Paul got put in a Philippian jail in Acts 16 is because he was accused of encouraging behavior that was against our customs. That is, you're not being very Philippian, Paul. Now, as we look at chapter 1, verse 27, we read these words. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, those words, um, conduct uh, yourselves uh, in a manner worthy, is, I don't like doing this very often, the, the, the Greek word is basically politio, from which we get political. You know, we get that sort of idea. Uh, that is, you are called to live in a right political way. Uh, that is, that the Christian is asked, whatever happens, be a citizen worthy of the gospel. And in fact, some of the older translations would use that word citizen in particular. Citizen yourself in a worthy manner of the gospel. Live as a Christian. At whatever happens, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Be a worthy citizen of it. So if a Philippian had a particular way about they were supposed to live, so the Christian should also, the Christian should live like a Christian. Now, it's not that you can tell who Christians are necessarily by their clothing. 
uh, and it's not, you know, because it's a worldwide, um, you can go anywhere in the world and you might find Christians, again, it's not a particular habit either, but so what is it about a Christian that means that they should um, be obviously a citizen of the gospel? Well, I think really what's helpful for us to think about this, what is our primary identity? That is, if I were to ask you what's the most important thing about you, what would you tell me? So if I were to ask um, one of my children, um, she would say, I'm Abby and I'm six. The most important thing you need to know about Abby is that she is six as far as she's concerned. That is fundamental to who she is. She is six. Uh, if you ask somebody um, else, uh, they might say that um, I am uh, Fred and I'm a lawyer. Because the most important thing you need to know about me is that I'm very important, thank you very much, because I am, after all, a lawyer. There's all sorts of ways in which we describe ourselves to different people to let people know who we are. But I think what Paul is wanting us to see is that our first priority, our first identity, is as a Christian. So whatever happens, I would say, I'm Tom and I am a Christian, which means I'm loved by God from eternity past to eternity future. So when I am being a vicar, first and foremost, I am a Christian. I do my vicaring as a Christian. Sometimes we might think of it the other way round, that actually, if I were to say I am first and foremost a vicar, and therefore I have all sorts of jobs I have to do as a vicar, and the Christian bit could be almost a hobby on the side. Do you see how that would be the wrong way around? First and foremost, my identity is I am a Christian and I do vicar, I do dad, I do husband. And everything I do, I do through the lens of being a Christian. That is the most important thing about me. So Paul can say whatever happens, that's whatever goes on in life, and, and for Paul particularly, it's whatever happens in his life, we are to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whatever happens, be a Christian because you are a Christian. Live a Christian life. Live a gospel life. And what does that mean? Well, it means as we carry on that whether um, Paul was going to go and visit them or, or, or otherwise, he would say, I know you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one for the faith of the gospel. What does it look like to live as a Christian? It is to stand as one and to strive together. That is unity. Christians are united and are to maintain that unity. And of course, unity is when different people who may have different sort of experiences, backgrounds and things like that, come together with one aim, one focus, and one purpose. So just think about the queue, as it has been called. People from all over, at the world actually, turning up, united, in walking that very long queue for very many hours with one aim, to bring respect uh, and uh, to send condolences to Her Majesty the Queen. There is a unity because of the one aim, the one focus, the one purpose. And um, what Paul says here is that we, are to um, that we are to stand firm and contend for the faith of the gospel. That is the aim. That, that is the focus. That is what unites us, is contending for the gospel. One aim, one aim is to get there. The faith of the gospel. What is it that the Christian uh, who is living rightly should be caring about. It's not just unity for unity's sake. We, we can all be nice and friendly and have cups of tea together. Uh, but how, what are we united around? It is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. As chapter 2 will go on to say, it is of the Jesus Christ who comes down from heaven, is born as a man, uh, and then pays, for his, uh, pays on the cross, gives his life on the cross, pays the penalty for our sins so that we can be forgiven and through faith become a citizen. We are united in that, in the faith of the gospel. 
And that faith in the gospel then needs to grow in the world and grow in ourselves. And we promote that in that way. Now, there does need to be an agreement about what the gospel is. And, and where there isn't agreement on what the gospel is, then there isn't going to be unity. So if one says God says this is a good thing, and another group says, no, God says um, this isn't a good thing, if God says this is a sin and someone else says, no, God says this is a wonderful thing, well, then we're not in agreement of what the gospel is. And then there can't be unity. There's going to be fraction. But citizens of the gospel strive together, strive together for the faith of the gospel. Now, that word strive, of course, means hard work. In fact, again, the, the, the word is athleticize. We are supposed to athleticize together. We're to do athletics together. Uh, working hard to strive for the faith of the gospel. It's going to be hard work. And so in chapter 2, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. How are we going to be able to maintain this unity with this one focus of the faith of the gospel? It is as we think about ourselves less. <laughs> think of the Lord Jesus and think of one another. It will be hard work. But we are going to need each other to do this. And uh, as he says, you know, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, uh, then, then be the same-minded. So it's a little bit like this. I, I, I have three children, and um, I, I'm sure it doesn't never happen in any of your families, but they don't always get on. Um, and when one is being unkind about the other... It hurts me, because I think they're both brilliant. And actually, this is kind of saying that if you, child A, have any love for me and, 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 and love the fact that I love you, well, you'll know how much I love your brother or sister, and so you should do too. And that's what Paul is kind of asking us to do, that as we realize that just as Stephen loves the Lord Jesus... So does Trevor love the Lord Jesus. Now, they've, got to, they've got to love each other because they've got the same Father who loves them. And so he wants us to stand as one together. So Paul says, as citizens of the gospel, you live that worthy life which is standing as one, unafraid. Unafraid, without being frightened, verse 28, in any way by those who oppose you. It is a call to boldness, not being worried about what other people think about us. And again, as we try and bring out the gospel, as we uh, share it, as we invite people to real lives, we may find that people are, think you're a bit odd. <laughs> they might think, well, why would I want to go and hear about that? But giving the invitation is, is an important part of what it is to be a Christian. Uh, I was thinking um, earlier this week, uh, because... Um, it goes on to say, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. One of the gifts that God gives us is the privilege of suffering for the gospel. And I think of every remembrance parade that I've been in. There are usually some veterans there with their medals. Why? Because they're proud to have served. It's been an honor to have served, and some of them have even borne the scars as a result of serving. It has been an honor. And actually, that is one of the things about being a citizen of the gospel. The first one is that we might suffer for it. It is an honor to suffer for the gospel. So Paul wants us to see that um, we are citizens of the gospel. That's primarily who we are. We are those who are Christian, therefore live as Christian. And what does that look like? It means working together, striving together as one to get the gospel out in ourselves and out in the world, and doing so unafraid. Doing so knowing that indeed we might suffer, but that it's an honor to do so, because the king who loves us because the God who loved us so much that he would give his one and only son. As we share bread and wine later, we do so remembering what 
he did for us, the great love that he has for us. And as we consider his love and his sacrifice, so we realize it is indeed an honor to suffer for him. Amen.